All right. We'll begin this service in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Our call to worship this morning is from Psalm 150. It says this, Praise the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty expanse. Praise Him for His mighty deeds. Praise Him according to His excellent greatness. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And so with that, I'll invite you to stand as we sing our opening hymn, if you're able to, uh, hymn number 197 in the blue hymnal. Hymn number 197, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Who made heaven and earth. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, we poor sinners confess unto you that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you by thought, word, and deed, whereupon we come for refuge to your infinite mercy, seeking and imploring your grace for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. O most merciful God, who has given your only begotten Son to die for us, have mercy upon us, and for his sake, 
grant us remission of all our sins, and by your Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of you and of your will, and true obedience to your word, that by your grace we may come to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy upon us and has given his only Son to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins. To them that believe on his name, he gives a power to become the sons of God and bestows on them his Holy Spirit. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Grant this, O Lord, unto us all. be seated. Our first lesson is taken from 1 Samuel 2, verses 1 through 10. It can be found on page 420 of the Pew Bibles. Then Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoices in the Lord. In the Lord my horn is lifted high. My mouth boasts over my enemies, for I delight in your deliverance. There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. Do not keep talking so proudly, or let your mouth speak such arrogance. For the Lord is a God who knows and by him deeds are weighed. The bows of the warriors are broken, but those who stumbled are armed with strength. Those who were full hire themselves out for food, but those who were hungry hunger no more. She who was barren has borne seven children, but she who has had many sons pines away. The Lord brings death and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and raises up. The Lord sends poverty and wealth. He humbles and he exalts. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. He seats them with princes and has them inherit a throne of honor. For the foundations of the earth are the Lord's. Upon them he has set the world. He will guard the feet of his saints, but the wicked will be silenced in darkness. It is not by strength that one prevails. Those who oppose the Lord will be shattered he will thunder against them from heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. The second lesson is from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6 on page 1821. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient 
bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Here ends the lesson. gospel reading for this morning can be found on page 1621 in your pew bibles it's luke chapter 14 verses 1 through 11 again that can be found on page 1621 in your pew bibles luke chapter 14 verses 1 through 11 i'll invite you to stand out of respect for the gospel if you're able to glory be to thee o lord luke chapter 14 beginning at verse 1 reading in jesus name One Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee, he was being carefully watched. There in front of him was a man suffering from dropsy. Jesus asked the Pharisees and experts in the law, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. So taking hold of the man, he healed him and sent him away. Then he asked them, if one of you has a son or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath day, will you not immediately pull him out? And they had nothing to say. When he noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor for a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, give this man your seat. Then humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But when you are invited, take the lowest place so that when your host comes, he will say to you, friend, Move up to a better place. Then you'll be honored in the presence of all your fellow guests. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Here ends the gospel reading this morning. Praise be to thee, O Christ. Will you join with me in confessing our Christian faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed? That can be found on page 32 in your blue hymnals. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, from where he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Our next hymn is hymn number 568 in the blue hymnal. Day by day, hymn number 568 in the blue hymnal.
The first time dropping off your kid can be a bit traumatic. A million questions can set in, what if your kid needs you? What if something goes wrong? Will he be okay? What if she cries the whole time? What if my kid doesn't appreciate the babysitter or teacher? How will the other kids relate to my kid? And the list goes on. It can be worrisome for parents. Chances are, though, most of the time, all you're worrying is for not. Your kid is going to be just fine. Everything turns out to be okay. It's only for a few hours. Your kid comes back home at the end of the day, and life continues on. But then your kids get older, and they're away longer. And they go off to college or a trade school, and, and all those emotions come rushing back in again. Will your child be okay? He's still just a boy. At least he's only 12 in my eyes, even though he might be 32 at this time. Then you start asking, will they meet a spouse? Will they be able to find a job? And if they find a job, how far away from home will that job take them? And as the reality of these questions begin to settle in, it's not uncommon for a wave of emotions to come with them. And some parents might be sad because their little Johnny is all grown up and he's an adult. And that parent-child relationship has changed. There are other parents who are excited to see what will happen with their kid, beaming with pride at the potential of being successful based on whatever measure we determine success. And then there are other parents who shake the dust off their feet, turn around, and celebrate their empty nest, excited that it's finally here after however many years. There's a wide variety of responses when you release your kids from your parental oversight. The prophet Samuel shares one of those responses with a parent who is dropping off her son. And Keith had read it, but I'll invite you to open your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 2, and, and I'll read this again. And out of respect for God's word, if you're able, I'll invite you to stand. But as we hear again Hannah's prayer as she drops her son Samuel off, entrusting him into Eli's care. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Again, reading in Jesus' name. Then Hannah prayed and said, My heart exalts in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth speaks boldly against my enemies, because I rejoice in your salvation. There is no one holy like the Lord. Indeed, there is no one besides you, nor is there any rock like our God. Boast no more so very proudly. Do not let arrogance come out of your mouth, for the Lord is a God of knowledge, and with him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty are shattered. But the feeble gird on strength. Those who were full hire themselves out for bread, but those who were hungry cease to hunger. Even the barren gives birth to seven, but she who has many children languishes. The Lord kills and makes alive. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. The Lord makes poor and rich. He brings low. He also exalts. He raises the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with nobles and inherit a seat of honor. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and he set the world on them. He keeps the feet of his godly ones, but the wicked ones are silenced in darkness. For not by might shall a man prevail. Those who contend with the Lord will be shattered. Against them he will thunder in the heavens. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth, and he will give strength to his king, and will exalt the horn of his anointed. Father God, these are your words, and your word is truth. We pray this morning that you would sanctify us in your truth. Give us understanding, give us wisdom, give us insight. Lord, give us humility as well. As we open your word, we pray that you would reveal uh, our situations to ourselves and help us to draw comfort in who you are and what you have done. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. For anyone who has ever entrusted their child into someone else's care, we can relate with Hannah to a certain extent. Only when we drop off our kids, we expect to see them in a couple of hours or in a few days, or at least have them home for the holidays. It's easy for us to glaze over the significance of what Hannah is doing here. She isn't dropping off her child at daycare. She isn't dropping him off at preschool where she'll come back at the end of the day to pick him up. 
And she isn't dropping him off while she goes on a trip only to return in a week or so. Hannah is dropping off her child for good. It's not because she doesn't love Samuel. It's not because she couldn't care for Samuel either. Hannah is fulfilling her vow to the Lord. As the book of 1 Samuel begins, we are introduced to a man, a man by the name of Elkanah. And he has two wives, one who, couldn't, who could produce offspring, Peninnah, and another wife who was barren, who no matter how hard they tried, could not have kids. And that was Hannah. And these two wives didn't get along. Hannah was the favored wife, but she couldn't produce a child. And the wife who could made sure to remind Hannah that she was inferior, that she was not the wife who could actually do a wifely duty for her husband, constantly irking her and saying awful things like, the Lord has closed your womb. God doesn't love you. How could my husband love you? He loves me. After all, I have given him children. What have you done? For anyone who has struggled with infertility, you know the gut-wrenching pain that those comments can cause, and they don't go away, to the point where you may even begin to believe these comments, where Hannah could believe, you know what, maybe she's right. Maybe God doesn't love me. Maybe my husband, who has been giving me a double portion of food to show that he still loves me and cares for me, maybe that's all just a farce. Maybe he doesn't love me either. If the Lord loved me, he'd give me a child, and so on. And the reasoning can go on. It was a constant for Hannah. And year after year, Hannah would go up to the house of the Lord, and Hannah would ask the Lord for a child. Year after year, no child would come. Would the Lord ever hear her prayer? Would the Lord ever act? Would she ever have a child? Hannah tried bargaining bargaining with the Lord, saying that, Lord, if you give me a child, I will give him back to you. If only you would give me a son. And she is praying so fervently and zealously that the priest, Eli, the one who should have ministered to her, the one who should have heard her concerned and pray, pray for her, the one who should have given her a sympathetic ear, thought she was drunk and dismissed her and told her to leave the house of the Lord. The priest scolds Hannah. If that's not kicking someone when they're down, I don't know what is. And after straightening out matters, the priest dismisses Hannah with a blessing. And next we read in 1 Samuel 1 that the Lord remembered Hannah, and Hannah conceived. And she gave birth to Samuel, and she kept him at home until he was weaned. And then she would drop him off at the house of the Lord forever. This is what happens at the end of 1 Samuel chapter 1, and and this is a background to chapter 2, where Hannah has just dropped off her son. And think of the significance here. Think of the act that Hannah is doing. The son, the one for whom she has prayed for years. The son, the proof that the Lord heard her, that the Lord saw her, the Lord loved her, the Lord answers prayers. Samuel was the objective reality to ground Hannah in the truth, in the midst of all of the lies and accusations that Peninnah would throw her way, he was her comfort, the troubled relationship at home. I'm not insignificant. I'm not worthless. I have provided a son. And she freely gives this son up. Now Hannah gives it all up by dropping him off at the house of the Lord, and, and she responds now in prayer. And in her prayer, she praises the Lord. There's not a graduation party that's here. He's weaned. He's being dropped off. He's so young. Will Eli raise him? Will he show him the love that only a mother can show him? Who will be his father? He is going to Eli, not to his father. He's being taken out of his home and into the house of the Lord. All of the concerns that Hannah could have had, but instead she freely gives up her son in trusting Samuel to the Lord's care. When Hannah could have placed her value as a mom and her son Samuel, instead she looks to the Lord. What changed Hannah's predicament as a barren wife wasn't the fact that she had Samuel, though that definitely helped, but it was the fact that the Lord has worked in her life. The Lord has provided a child for her. 
And so she exalts in the Lord. And as great as finally having a son is, Hannah is looking to something far greater than a child. She looks ahead to salvation. The Lord has delivered her from her arrogant rival. The Lord has made his love known for her and his care for her known. The Lord has reversed her lot in life and has humbled the proud. The Lord has done this. Not Hannah, not Samuel, not Elkanah, but the Lord. When the circumstances in life seem to dictate our hope, the Lord is at work behind the scenes, behind our present circumstances. The hungry are fed, the text says, and those who are satisfied lose their satisfaction. The Lord takes life, and the Lord gives life. He makes poor and rich. Not the government, not our children, not our ability to play the cards that we've been dealt. He is the one who honors. He is the one who humbles. He accomplishes justice against those who contend with the Lord. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. The Lord is at work here, even in Hannah's circumstances. And this is her confidence. This is her comfort. This is her prayer. For Hannah's life, this was a tremendous turn of events for her. She kept her vow to the Lord and was able to sit back and watch the faithfulness of God unfold. She gave up her firstborn son, but had gained so much more. She also had more future, more children to care for and nurture in the future. The Lord had reversed Hannah's situation. She knew the Lord loved her. She knew the Lord heard and cared for her. She knew the Lord was the only one who could provide what she needed. And she knew that the Lord was the one who could shut up the mouth of Peninnah, who was constantly nagging her. The Lord is a God of reversals. It's easy to get caught up in the moment that we, so caught up in this moment that we fail to see the grander scheme that is at play here. And Hannah sees that grander scale, which is why she praises the Lord. And though she may not be able to fully articulate it, her prayer is far more than a thanks for my son God prayer. In the birth of Samuel, the Lord is at work to reverse Hannah's situation and her circumstances, but also to reverse your situation and your circumstances. And that seems to be a bit of an abrupt jump, and it is. Let's look further into that claim here. Hannah's child is Samuel. You can read about his life in First and Second Samuel and read about all the things that the Lord did through him. Eli was the priest that he was entrusted to with raising Samuel. And his own sons, his two sons, were both worthless. They were corrupt priests. These are the people who are supposed to lead God's people in worship. And instead of serving the Lord, instead of serving the people, they fleeced the people and served themselves. Samuel was the vessel the Lord used to accomplish his purposes. He was a faithful priest. And towards the end of Samuel's life, when the people clamored for a king, he says, tell me how I have ever served you wrong, to get no response. The people recognized his faithfulness. And the Lord still provided a king for his people. He anointed the first king of Israel through Samuel, this little boy, when he was grown up. He anointed King Saul. And Samuel continued to instruct his people in the good and right way. Even when the king acted in ways contrary to the Lord, Samuel confronts the king. All power, all authority that the king had, Samuel confronts the king. And when Saul foolishly offered the sacrifice to the Lord, rather than patiently waiting for Samuel, Samuel rebukes him. And the Lord humbles King Saul and removes the throne from the king. Samuel would then go on to anoint the next king of Israel, a man who didn't have that same kingly stature that King Saul had. He was the runt of a litter. He's a poor shepherd boy. And the Lord revealed to David, revealed David to Samuel. And the Lord took the shepherd boy and reversed his circumstances, his course of life as well, from being keeping, from just keeping sheep and being the lowest on the totem pole to ascending to the king of the nation to shepherding the people of God. Hannah reveals in her prayer, it is not by might that man prevails. It wasn't Saul's might, it wasn't David's might, but the Lord who was at work in and through them. 
both of these kings and all of Israel, and all of Judah's kings, in fact, had failed. Some were better than others, that's true, and others were downright awful. In these last two verses of this text, Hannah prays, he keeps the feet of his godly ones, but the wicked ones are silenced in darkness. For not by might shall a man prevail. Those who contend with the Lord will be shattered. Against them he will thunder in the heavens. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth, and he will give strength to his king, and will exalt the horn of his anointed. Saul foolishly thought that his might led to his victory. David thought that he could keep his sin against Bathsheba a secret, but his actions didn't solve anything. They only made matters worse. The strength and the cunning of man is entirely inadequate to save. It's entirely inadequate to deliver. It is woefully insufficient to produce life. The Lord is the one who keeps the godly ones. He is the one who purifies and the one who protects, the one who sustains. He is the one to reverse our predicament, to bring life where there is only death by giving strength to his king and exalting his anointed, which Hannah points forward to. Those who contend with the Lord will be shattered, the text says, and it's as plain as day for us, black and white, but that hasn't stopped us from trying, has it? And we continue to contend against the Lord, claiming that our ways are better than his ways, demanding that he submit to our will and our desires and our purposes. We have a hard time accepting his will, his good and gracious and perfect will. We insist that we know better than he does. We insist that he doesn't truly know our circumstances, and if he did truly know everything that we were going through, then he would prevent whatever it is that's happening from happening to us. Otherwise, he wouldn't make such impossible demands and keep such a strict account of our lives. The Lord judges those who contend against him. And he doesn't have some kind of contentious scale where he says, okay, once it gets up to this level, now I'm going to judge you. But every act of disobedience, every inaction of obedience is contending with the Lord. No matter how big or small it seems to be on our scales, the Lord will judge the ends of the earth. And there isn't an escaping from his judgment. However, in this text, we're pointed to a hope. As the God of the great reversal would act again, not only reversing Hannah's circumstances, but reversing our circumstances. As he gives strength to his king, and as he will exalt in the horn of his anointed. That word anointed, that's the first time in scripture that that we find it here in the text. That's the word that we use for Messiah. It's the word that we use for Christ. It's talking about elevating Christ even here in the Old Testament. God is using Samuel to reveal the Messiah, to reveal the Christ to the people. As the previous kings stirred a sense of anticipation for a king who was good, for a king who cared for them, a king who would deliver them, a king who would rule with justice, a king who would serve his people and establish righteousness. And as each and every king failed to accomplish that purpose, the longing in their hearts would only grow. A king who would grow his kingdom and protect his people. This king that was coming would be strengthened by the Lord and he would be exalted, the horn of his anointed. It would be the long-anticipated Christ who would usher in his kingdom, one not defined by political boundaries, but defined by life and salvation one in which and through whom another great reversal would take place, one in which there was forgiveness and freedom when there ought to just be condemnation, judgment, and death. As Christ entered this world, born again of a barren woman, a woman who could not have kids because she was a virgin, dedicated to the Lord and served as a priest, would end up being the great high priest. He would be the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. He convicts the world of sin and righteousness. And the Lord gave up his firstborn son, too. And like Samuel, Jesus would be the, a faithful high priest, would be the faithful high priest who would minister not only for the people of Israel, but minister on behalf of the entire world. And this is where you and I are brought into this picture. 
as the Lamb of God takes away the sin of the world, offering life and salvation in His name. We can look at our sin, we can look at our failures, we can look at our struggles, and we can say, Lord, I deserve judgment because of what Christ has done. We're the recipients of this great reversal. In exchange for our sin, we receive the righteousness of Christ Himself. Hannah sees the Lord's hand at work and acknowledges the fact that her son, the one who meant so much to her, would be used of God for, her, for his purposes in bringing life to the world. And in that fact, Hannah rejoices. The great reversal. This is why Hannah prays this prayer. She praises the Lord for his work in her life, and not only hers, but the Lord's work in the world. He reverses the fate of those who are broken over their sins. And for those who are content in their sin, he reverses that comfort as well and afflicts them. Whether that's judgment here in this life or judgment for all eternity. Those who are comforted in their unbelief will remove, have their comfort removed from them. This Savior, this God, is still the God of great reversals for you. He has acted to provide salvation to raise those who are crushed over their sin from the dust and inherit a seat of honor. He is the one who keeps the feet of his godly ones. And he who began a good work in you will bring it about to perfection. We prevail and persevere through this Messiah, through Christ. And as Hannah prays and closes out her prayer, this is, there is no one holy like the Lord. Indeed, there is no one besides you, nor is there any rock like our God. I rejoice in your salvation. When our hope is placed in, in this Lord and in his purposes and his work, then we can drop our kids off with all assurance and all comfort. Then we can face whatever it is that this life has to offer with all comfort and assurance. We can go through the circumstances of life that we would much rather ignore, not have to deal with, and we can do it with joy because we know what Christ has done for you. We know that there is a great reversal when God takes us from this life and brings us to himself in heaven where all the pain and suffering and torment that we deal with here on a daily basis is reversed and we receive Christ and comfort and peace and everlasting salvation. Praise be to God. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word and for its truth. Lord, we thank you for the promises that your word has for us and the comfort that it, it gives to us. God, that you are the one who has come for us. There is no one holy like you. Lord, that includes us as well. We pray that you would keep us humble, God, that as we see our sin, that we would confess that and bring our guilt before you, knowing that you are the one who elevates the humble. Lord, you have placed us in seats of honor because of what you have done. And God, we pray that you would be with those in this life who are content in their sin, that you would bring about uh, conviction of sin. And God, that you would break us over our own pride and arrogance, that we would be humble before you and come before you, that we might find forgiveness and salvation in you. Father, help us to remember and know that those who contend against you will be shattered. And to, Lord, come before you in confession with humility and seeking your grace and your favor and appreciating your son and the gift that he is for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. This time we'll take our offering, our Sunday school offering in the back is going to Andrew and Alexis Olson as they are working with Bible translation and we'll take our church offering here now.
Dear Heavenly Father, we pray that your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. We thank and praise you that your good and gracious will is done even without our prayer. But we pray that it may be done among us also. Destroy and bring to nothing every evil counsel and purpose of the devil, the world, and our own sinful flesh, which would hinder us from keeping your name holy and prevent the coming of your kingdom. Strengthen us and keep us steadfast in your word and in faith until our time on earth is done. Lord, as we give back to you a portion of that with which you've blessed us, we pray, Lord, that you would use these gifts to further your kingdom here in our midst and around the world as well. We pray for those who are listed in our bulletins dealing with various health concerns, for Lauren, Donovan, Connie, Alan, Dave, Judy, Annie, Kim, Jan, and Karen. Lord, you know each one of these people's situations. We pray that you administer to them in your grace and in your goodness. Help them to know, Lord, that you are with them. We pray for all of those who are with child. We think of Lachey and Cassidy. Father, we praise you for this gift of new life. We pray, Lord, for safe deliveries and that these children would grow up to love and serve you all the days of their lives. We pray for all of those who are suffering from miscarriages. Lord, for those who are grieving infertility as well. Father, those who are waiting for adoption, we pray that you would provide families for those without families. We pray, Lord, that you would be with all of the women who are in crisis pregnancies now too. Come alongside them, Lord. Show them hope. Show them uh, people who care about them and who will help them out too. Father, we pray for the residents of our nursing homes and assisted living. Think of Edna for Helen and Marjorie. Father, be with these women. Draw near to them as they draw near to you. Be with our students and our congregations. Uh, we pray for Jenna, for CJ, Samuel, Brendan, Evan, Judith, myself. Lord, we also pray for teachers as well and for school boards. Father, we pray that uh, these places would be places of truth and respect and honor and integrity as well. And places of safety, God. We pray that you'd be with those serving in our military. We think of Aaron and Andrew. Lord, for all of those who are deployed and for all those who are returning back home, we think of the veterans too, Father. We pray that you would provide for their needs. We pray that you'd be with our country. For every one of our leaders, whether a local, state, or federal level, give them wisdom, Lord. Give them wisdom that comes from you. We pray for our police. We pray that you would watch over them and protect them as they seek to protect us. And Father, we pray for integrity in their positions as well. We pray for our communities. We thank you for sparing us from harm. And Father, we do pray for those communities that are dealing with the various kinds of harm around this world, whether it's flood or fires or, Lord, any other tragedies. We pray that you would comfort them and provide for them. Lord, that they would draw near to you during this time. Send a revival here, Lord. And may it start with us. We do pray for our association retreat center in Wisconsin and for the staff that are there. Father, we thank you for your provision. We pray that you would continue to sustain them and, and bring more staff, Lord, with the right hearts who will serve, serve you and serve your people. We pray, Lord, that you'd be with our persecuted brothers and sisters around the world. Encourage them and strengthen them in and, and the faith today and be with their persecutors as well. Lord, draw them to yourself. Be with our seminary interns as they are continuing to learn what it means to be a pastor after your own heart. Father, we pray that you would give them a love for you and a love for others and give them wisdom, Lord, that they would shepherd, uh, shepherd congregations wisely. We pray for our missionaries of the month, for Andrew and Alexis Olson, for Mariah, Selah, and Eliana. Father, we pray that you would be with Mariah and Selah as they start school this fall. Continue to draw them near to yourself, and Lord, continue to build them into the people that you are calling them to be for whatever vocation that you have in store for them. We pray now, Lord, that you would uh, hear us as we pray the prayer that you have taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. closing hymn this morning is hymn number 581 in the blue hymnal, 
Like a River Glorious, hymn number 581 in the Blue Hymnal. <laughs> 